Uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the 12th chapter, for a reading, then we'll have a word of prayer. This is our lesson text in a series of an Easter 23 special. I've got four lessons for you on this Easter special dealing with the whole idea of the resurrection of Christ. In my opinion, there's two key chat, there's two key v passages of scripture for you to understand the resurrection of Christ. One is Leviticus 23, where it sets up seven national holidays of messianic holidays. For the first four listed in Leviticus 23 deal with the first coming of Christ and the last three deal with the second coming of Christ. They were Messianic Jewish holidays. You will never understand the first four if you don't understand Leviticus in the reality of how they played out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's my opinion. Once you understand that, you understand the order. He's got to die on a certain date. He's got to be buried on a certain period of time. He's got to be resurrected on a certain period of time in order for the church to begin at Pentecost. There are four sequent of events that are described by Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, 1 through 22, that says Christ dies, he's buried, he's raised, and from his resurrection, there is the Feast of Weeks called, we call it Pentecost, Acts 2. And there are sequence of events that are described by, in the book of Leviticus 23 in the law. Write this on your paper. Matthew 5, 17. In Matthew 5, 17, we are told that Jesus must fulfill the messianic laws pertaining for his first coming as well as his second coming to be declared the Messiah. He's got, to, he's got to fulfill the law. And Leviticus is part of that law. Just write it down. You can look up and read it later. I just gave it to you. So here we are in Matthew. Now here's the second passage. The first passage is Leviticus 23, 1 through 22, which describes the first four uh, messianic holidays that are important, all dealing with his first coming. The second passage for you to understand his resurrection is recorded in Matthew 12. Our passage today, we're in Matthew 12. We're looking at verses 38 through 40. 38 through 40. Here's how it reads. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, by the time we get to verse 38, he's shown them quite a few signs. If you read chapter 12, he has shown them a bunch of signs. But no matter what he showed them, it was never enough. It, it never, they always wanted something more, something more spectacular. Raise the dead. Give me something more. Uh, heal the blind from birth. Give me something more. That, that's evil. That's evil. Now, so we want to see a sign from you. If you read Matthew 12, you've seen, well, if you, met, if you read Matthew 1 through chapters 12, you know he's shown them a lot. He answered and said to them, watch this now, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. You know what it is? It means you can never fill their appetite. You, you can never satisfy evil. The, the, more, the more it gets, the more it wants. An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. Notice the word generation. It's a specific period in biblical history dealing with Messiah. An evil and adulterous generation. A generation. You understand? He didn't say a people. He said a generation, didn't he? That's more than one point. Right? It's more, well, what date is it? Well, here it is. No, a generation is a, a whole period of time, isn't it? 
In other words, this group of people he's with is asking for a sign, has been asking for a sign for a long time, for many years. Right? All right. And even though adults of generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So here's the sign from Jonah the prophet. Second Jonah 2.17. If you have a study Bible, it's going to put you into Jonah 2.17, the last verse of the second chapter. Here's what it writes. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. How long was Jonah in the belly of the sea monster? Right? Be sure you quote the scripture right. Three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. You, you, you with me? We talked about the sea monster. I don't know. I've been teaching so much. Uh, come off from day five. Anybody remember where I taught that? Was that Tuesday? I think maybe we did, yeah. I think we did it at our Saturday study. Jonah was three days to three nights in the belly of the sea monster. Thank you, Willie. I think you're absolutely right. So, right, just as so, just as Jonah, so the Son of Man, a reference to Jesus Christ prophetically. So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights. How many? That's, how many does the Bible say? Three days. Three days. Okay. Give me the whole thing. Don't give me three days now. Right? That's that's a problem. Is three days and three nights. That's a whole day. That's a whole whole situation, isn't it? Yeah. Well, if you go to a hotel and you want a day and a night, you're going to pay for it all, right? I don't care if you leave in the middle of the day. No. Oh. Uh, the Son of Man will be three days to three nights. Where? In the heart of the earth. Where did Jesus go after he died on the cross? His body went to the tomb, but where did his soul go? It went to Hades or Sheol. Right? Right. And he went to a, went to a, he started, he told the thief on the cross, I'll see you today in Sheol. Where? Paradise. 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 There was a paradise. There was a place where the believer went. There was a place called torment where the unbeliever went. And there was a place called Tatharis or the abyss where the fallen angels of Genesis 6 are or were. And where is all that located? In the heart of the earth. And in the heart of the earth. And, he, and listen, he'll be, Jesus will be there for how many days? <clears throat> Three days and how many nights? Three. He'll be there for three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster. Don Toole, and I, every time I think about this, Don Toole wrote one of the most magnificent papers in the School of Biblical Theology on this very subject of how far out the sea monster picked him up to bring him back to the plan of God. You know, God is always about bringing you home, always trying to bring you back from wandering away from the will of God back to the will of God, and he, and he uses all kinds of things. This time he used a sea monster that came along, swallowed him up, and couldn't eat him. Don't you know that was a mouthful of stuff? Wow. Well, it's a wonderful story. Here we are with a, with a connected, with the story of Jonah is connected with what? Is connected with the burial of Jesus Christ, and uh, and coming out into mission work. Right? Would Jonah come out? Did he go? He, he was given the plan of God again. He said, "Look, you're back. Let me tell you what I told you in chapter one. I'm going to tell you in chapter three. Go to the mission field, Patty. Go to the mission field and say, well, okay, I'm going to go to the mission field. I'm a little afraid of that whole idea. I don't know if I'm going to be happy with that, but I'm going to go because I feel led by God." And so that's how this worked, works. So three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, okay? In the heart of the earth. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into the morning study so that the next two weeks I can spend time on the actual death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
so that we can understand the prophetic meaning behind it all, because that's very important. So let's pray. Remember, as a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the church age, you cannot study the Bible in the flesh. You're in the flesh because you're, you can identify personal sin in your life. That's carnality. You confess that sin, it moves you out of carnality and back into spirituality. You confess by 1 John 1, 9, one among many. But if I confess, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all sin. So I'm going to give you a moment. Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins. Look at it, confess it in your privacy of your own priesthood, and then I'll have prayer with you. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that freedom gives us by the grace of God. Not that we deserve it, not that we've earned it, but is given to us as the grace of God. The institution of freedom, and America has always embraced it up to this day. Now we're in jeopardy, Father, of losing the freedom of a divine institution, number one. I pray, Father, the church would keep that thing alive through Jesus Christ, because it is Paul that describes it in Galatians 1 and 5, 1, and then 13, when he says, it was for freedom that Christ sets you free. We will be free no matter who rules us because our rulership belongs to Jesus Christ. And Father, may we never forget that. May we never forget that and that it is a gift of grace. So we applaud you for it today. We're thankful for it today in America. I pray today, Father, you would enlighten our eyes and our hearts to understand the prophetic background to the death, burial, and resurrection and the establishment of the church in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you recall from last week, I introduced you to the seven messianic uh, holidays that is covered in Leviticus 23, 1 through 44. You should, be, you should familiarize yourself with that passage of Scripture. We learned that the first four messianic holidays of the, were connected with the first advent are located in the first 22 verses, and the last three, dealing with the second coming of Christ, are listed from 23 to 41 in Leviticus 23. It is essential, in my opinion, that you know about these holidays because the death, burial, resurrection, and Pentecost, or called the Feast of Weeks in the Hebrew, are all connected. One lights up another one like a chain smoking. One, two, three, four. It's not done till we get to four. That's important you understand that. And so we studied all that last week. If... Uh, if you would like to pick that up, you can go to our website, John, and you can go to the database for sure, or current studies, either way, and pick this up. So last week, we looked at these four Messianic holidays and laid them out. Today, we're going to look at the, the other passage that you must understand is Matthew 12, 38 through 40. How many days and nights does Jesus have to be in the grave? And is compared to a prophetic tie, is tied prophetically to, to, to Jonah. Agreed? Mm -hmm. So, point number one. And listen, you, you, you're not going to get this. You've got to connect the dots to get it. So point number one, one important aspect of Matthew 12, 38 through 40 is how it brings clarity to the three days and three nights of the burial of Jesus Christ and how it fits into the seven days of the Jewish unleavened bread. So I put on your paper, I laid this thing out on your paper, so pay attention to it. See where it says Passover? Okay, I want you to write above that now. Leviticus 23, 5. 
because that's where it is prophesied in the law. It's prophesied in the law. Passover. It is always a fixed date. It's always a fixed date. Like Christmas, the 25th. It's always a fixed date. It's always the 14th of Niacin. It's a fixed date. All right. On that day, notice I put Wednesday. Okay. Because I'm explaining why it's Wednesday. It didn't die on Friday, it died on Wednesday. And underneath that, I put Wednesday, and underneath that, I put the death of Christ. He died on the cross on Wednesday. Right? Now, we have seven days. The next festival is unleavened bread. And I have it on your paper. Unleavened bread. See unleavened bread on your paper? Above it, write Leviticus 23, 6 through 8. Because that's where it, it says it. It's not on your paper. You got to write. Yeah, you got to do a little something when you come. <laughs> okay, yeah, do a little something. There should be pencils in your pew. Uh, what did I say? Leviticus 23, 6 through 8, right? Where it talks about unleavened bread. Matthew 12, 38 through 40 is going to tell us that he's got to be buried how many days and nights? Three days and three nights. So that puts us, 50, first day of unleavened oven bread, oven bread. <laughs> unleavened bread always starts on the 15th, that's a date, and goes to the 21st, that's a date. It's a seven-day festival. Watch this now. The first day... 15th and the 21st are high Sabbaths. Circle the 15th and 21st. Those are high Sabbaths. Leviticus, Leviticus is going to tell you that. Leviticus is going to tell you that. These are high Sabbaths. Write this down. I've got it somewhere, but just write this down. John 19.31, they're called high Sabbaths or holy convocations. 1931. John 1931. Now, he's got to be, how many days? After he dies, he's going to be buried. How many? Three days to three nights. That puts us 15th. That's the first day of unleavened bread. That's the 15th, 16th, 17th. You understand that? We know this because on the first day of the week, I, our Sunday, he's out of the tomb, isn't he? All right. Now watch this. During this seven week, uh, during this seven day period of unleavened bread, there is always a weekly Sabbath. That's a day. Identified by a day. Do you understand? Well, you had seven days, you had a weekly Sabbath. <clears throat> which is a Saturday, right? It is just, it's some things just as, if you want to know, go study. Otherwise, just take my word for it now. A weekly Sabbath is always on what we call Saturday, and the next day is always the first day of the week. Always the first day of the week. The Jews didn't call them Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday. They called it Monday, they call it the first day of the week, the second day of the week, third day of the week, the fourth day of the week, fifth day of the week, sixth day of the week. We Gentiles name it. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. All right. How many days? He's got to be buried. Three days and three nights. We know that Passover, write this down, under Passover, write this down, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus is declared to be the, pass, the Passover lamb. Jesus is declared to be the Passover lamb. This Passover is the day he dies. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. I don't know what I said. 
But 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He's the Passover lamb. On that day, the Passover lamb's got to die. That's when it died. Then we go to unleavened bread. A seven-day festival goes from the 15th to the 21st. The first day is a holy Sabbath, is a high Sabbath, and the last day is a high Sabbath. It's treated like a weekly Sabbath, but it's not a weekly Sabbath. Do you understand that? I, you've just got to understand it. It's just, it's just Hebrew stuff. It, it's, it's Hebrew stuff. You just have to understand that. If you read Leviticus, you will, get, you will understand that. In that seven-day period, you've got to have a weekly Sabbath, right? Seven days, you've got to have a weekly Sabbath. It's always a day, not a date. Understand that? Come on now. You work, I'm working really hard. If you had your cup of coffee, okay. I seem to be working hard just to get you a cup of coffee. All right, look. He's in the grave Thursday, Friday, Saturday, out of the grave, right? Saturday is the weekly Sabbath. Do you understand that? That's a weekly Sabbath. It's treated like a Sabbath, but there's now we have three in one week, agreed? Always three in one week. The 15th and the 21st are always high Sabbaths. They're declared that in Leviticus 23. And you always have, if you have seven days, you have a weekly Sabbath. And all three of them are treated the same way as far as not doing anything and celebrating and honoring God in his plan. The first day after the weekly Sabbath is the first day of the week, and we call it Sunday. All right? Now listen to me. What, go back to your paper. See first fruits? That's the next thing coming out. See first fruits? Up on your paper. Above that, write Leviticus 23, 10 through 14. First fruits, the first day after the weekly Sabbath, it, the first day after the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread is called the Feast of First Fruits. I'm just telling you how, how it's identified. I put it on your paper. It is the day after the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread. See that? I'm trying to make this simple that you can get this because I'm going to tell you the church out there that doesn't understand this stuff is all over the place about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They're all over the place. Now, I'm glad that they teach on it. I'm glad that they have a death, burial, and resurrection, but we're going to be technical about it because God is. Now, we have his burial is the 15th, 16th, and 17th. That's our weekly day Sabbath. On the 18th is the first day of the week. He is out of the tomb. Right? Well, uh, you ever been to a sunrise service? You know why it's sunrise services? Why they do it as soon as the sun comes up? Because of the whole deal of this, the, what this story's about. Okay, sunrise service. Now, on the 18th, all the, whenever the weekly Sabbath is, the next day, it's a day and not a date, is first fruits. Agreed? I, did, I, I, did. I don't know why I'm asking you to agree. I, 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 if you have doubts about it, you go back to Leviticus and read it, and it, it, will, it will take away all your doubt. You know, people, if, why am I doing all this? Because people keep saying to me, where do you get that? So I'm telling you. I'm telling you exactly where you get it. All right, so we got Sunday, 18th is the first day of the week, or what we call Sunday, the first day of the week. Look at John 21, John, the 20th chapter, verse 1, when you look at this. And this is, this is what the resurrection of Christ, Easter, this is what Easter is all about. Watch this. Watch what John does. In John, the 20th chapter, verse 1, now on the first day of the week, what, what do you think that is? 
at Sunday. And for us, it's Sunday, isn't it? But it's first day of the week, you know. And what he's talking about is unleavened bread. He's talking about the day after the weekly Sabbath in the week of unleavened bread. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the, early to the tomb, that sunrise service business, while it was still dark, and saw the stone away from the tomb, and then there's a whole story connected with Mary, right? John says on the first day of the week, dawn, at, at dawn, it was still dark, looking for dawn when she went there. And the stone was rolled away. First day of the week. That's where we get this. So we have the death on the 14th, agreed? It's always then. Then we have the 15th, 16th, 17th. We don't know that unless we know Matthew, right? Matthew's the only one that records this. 15, 16, and 17, got to be three days and three nights. That takes us to the 18th, the first day, Sunday, the first day of the week, Sunday, when everybody declared the tomb was empty. Remember this. It's hard for Gentiles. So just write this down. I'll explain it later to you. Not today, but later in the deal. The Jewish day went from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. The Gentile day goes from 12 p.m. to 12 p.m., right? goes from 12 to 12, the Jewish day went from 6 to 6. So you have to think different when you're in time, when, you're, when they say a third hour to the ninth hour, Jesus on the cross and all that, you gotta, you've got to translate that into Jewish time. That's why I'm your teacher. That's why I'm your teacher. So now... First fruits, the first fruit festival is now, is now identified with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Agreed? First fruits, that is the day after the weekly Sabbath, which is the first day of the week, he's out of Zoom. And now we begin, and that's first fruits. Now listen to me. How do we know that? It, that's when it, he's out of the tomb. Well, they, it, we have a lot of witnesses said that he was out of the tomb. But why is that important that it was that occurred on first fruits? Because from first fruits, we begin to count seven complete Sabbath weeks. How many would that be? Seven times seven. Forty nine days. And on the 50th day, you have the week of feast. We change that word in Acts two to Pentecost which means 50th day. You understand that? His resurrection on first fruits is important because now there is one more thing that has to be counted in Leviticus. Agreed? Leviticus says now we still have one more to go and here's how we count it. It tells you. Write this down. Uh, 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 write this down. Leviticus uh, over feast of weeks. See feast of weeks? Right, Leviticus 23, 15 through 22. You can read it and study it, and it's wonderful. But you will never understand the plan of God and how exact everything has to be in regard to your salvation because your salvation is based on Jesus dies on that cross for your sin, is buried, and on the third day is out of the grave. He is resurrected, and we live in the power of that resurrection. You've got to understand this stuff, church. I know a lot of you understand this and are well, well advanced in it, but we've got to get a grip on it. This is Easter, and people are all over the place with it because they don't pay attention to the plan of God and how specific it is that things had to go orderly. And so we're, we're trying to, so from first fruit, we count, we count seven complete Sabbath weeks and the 50th day, right, is Pentecost or the Feast of the Weeks celebration. We call it Pentecost. Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks establishes the timetable for the church age. 
People go like, well, where did the church begin? Pentecost. That's the next thing. I mean, it, for the church to be in existence, you got to have Passover death. You got to have unleavened bread uh, burial and resurrection. And you have to have first fruits. Because the church is all about the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension and session when the church comes back. Because Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit in the churches. And people go, like, well, I think the church began in Acts 16 or something. Listen, it began in Acts 2, and there is no doubt about it. It has, it's all in an order. But people don't pay any attention to that stuff. It's, it all... He dies on a cross. He's got to go through unleavened bread. He, he's got to go through first fruits, and he's got to go to the feast of the weeks before this deal's over. And the feast of weeks is going to take 50 days to get it. Not three, not three days and three nights. 50 days. You understand? From, from the point of his resurrection, it's going to take 50 days to establish the church. That's when the church is established. There's no doubt about it. But nobody pays any attention to what Jesus came to fulfill the law. They don't pay any attention to it. They don't pay attention to Leviticus 23. But you, church, are... I didn't come out here to Moody for no reason. And that's to clear up a lot of gobbledygook. Well, anyhow. And so we find this wonderful thing in... Matthew 12, 40, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. My, my, my. Now I'm going to take you back because I've carried you so many different ways, you missed a point. Here's what I ask. What was Jesus referring to by no signs will be given to it? See, you miss that. Because sometimes we read the Bible and don't study it. Well, look, look at go to Matthew 12. Let's go back to Matthew 12 for just a moment. I got nothing else to do but teach. Don't have anything else I really want to do but teach. So here we are. I'm in verse 39. I don't know what your paper says, but it should say 1239. Does it say 1239? Yes. Okay, well, I'm so good to you people. An, adult, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign will be given to what? What's it say? It says to it, doesn't it? Look, you're missing this stuff. Yet no sign will be given to it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. What is the it? That evil, adulterous generation that craves a sign and misses the Son of God. Looking for a sign and ignore the Son of God. I hope that's not you today. What is Easter all about in your life? What's Easter about in your life? Is it the power of the resurrection of Christ that's in you? Listen to me. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside every believer's body. Did you know that? That's a happy Easter. Not that we just go around and have little chickens and eggs and rabbits and I don't know what else you do. I'm not opposed to those things. It's called playing with your children. If you want to play with colored eggs with your children, I don't care. That's not what Easter's about. Be sure you tell, set your children down and tell them what's Easter about. And then be sure that you're able to exhibit on that day that you live by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You live by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. 
Now you've got a happy Easter. And without that, you got nothing. You got an empty holiday. He was raised from three days and three nights of burial by the power of God that lives inside your body. Think about that. Let me tell you, if he can raise you, he can raise you from any problem you got, right? Maybe what's the worst problem you could possibly have? Well, if you're a believer, death is not a big issue with you. But for most people, it is. Fear of death. And for many of us, it would be a welcome, a welcome visit. But you have to be a little bit older than I am, I suppose. No sign will be given to what? To it. Do you think that do you think that we live in an evil and adulterous generation today? We have always lived in one. It is out and biting your something. It's pretty bold today, isn't it? I mean, you can talk to unbelievers that go like, "Whoa, we're in trouble." I mean, the unbeliever knows it. The unbeliever who goes for this goofiness, right, craves evil signs. And we're in trouble. And you know why we're in trouble? Listen to me. Don't blame it on the government. and Don't blame it on Biden. You know who you should blame it on? You know where the finger ought to be pointed? At us, the church of Jesus Christ. America is all about the light of Christ being sent to the world. We have been one of the greatest missionary evangelism arms ever. America in 200 years has done more than the church has done in a, in a 1,500 years. Church of Jesus Christ in America has always marched by the truth of the word of God and has been faithful to win those nearest to them and, and, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You know what that means? It means we win Moody. We win Sinclair County. We win Alabama. We win America. And we take it to the ends of the earth. Well, read Acts 1.8 sometime and apply it to yourself. And let me tell you, do you know that we're in the midst of a revival? Do you know that for two years... We have never failed to baptize monthly people brought into the kingdom of God in Moody. For two years, we have not failed one time, and we're not to buy. Listen, last week we baptized four and got four saved. Got four people who had come, got them, got them saved. We all, we all ought to be doing this. We ought to be bringing them in and training them and sending them out to the high schools and to the schools and to the neighborhoods of Moody and St. Clair County. I'm not going to be content just to win Moody. I'm not going to be content until we're to the uttermost parts of St. Clair County, and then we're going on. We should be thinking that way. Well, here's my second point, and it's a good thing I only have three. Jesus' teaching on the three days and three night burial and then, a res then his resurrection became a major issue to the religious Jews after his burial. On your own time, you want to read carefully now. Read to study. Read to study. See, we missed that to it just because they didn't read to study. Read Matthew 27, 62 to 66. Not now, but later. You have time. If for no other reason, keep your Bible in your bathroom. And when you sit on the commode, read that. I mean, you can do two things at one time. But let's not neglect the Word of God. Now listen to what Matthew 27, 62 through 64 says. Now on the next day, the day of preparation. You know what the day of preparation is? Passover. It's the preparation for leaving Egypt. On the next day, 
the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together and said uh, to, w before Pilate, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am, I'm going to rise from, I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has been risen from the dead. And the last deception, see, that's how evil, evil, listen to me. Evil calls good evil, right? It, evil calls evil good. Did I say that right? And, and good evil. Yeah. See, this is the way they, and it's because they, they work by deception. The third day, and his disciples will come, and the last deception, which is his resurrection, would be worse than the first, his declaration that he was the messianic savior of the world, that he came to save his people from their sins. <laughs> the devil's a liar. You do know that, don't you? You know, the, you call it the last deception. If you, you, young guys, you want a good sermon? Preach on the last deception. You want a good sermon? Preach on the last deception. You know what deception is? Listen to me. It's cosmos diabolicus thinking or the worldly thinking that's promoted by the devil in opposition to the, to, to the word of God. Hmm. I don't know. Got Eve, didn't her? Did he get Eve? Yeah. Did he get Peter? Yeah, Peter. So it be. Point number three, and I'll, I'll close and we'll get that cup of coffee I've been talking about. I shouldn't have talked about it, should I? Because now I've carried your thought to a different place. The, the guards. See, they requested... That Pilate put guard, sealed the tomb, and put guards at it. You know who these guards are? You know what Pilate told them? I'll seal the tomb, but you put your own guards out there. I don't care what they do with the body. <laughs> well, they're going to steal the body, and then they're going to declare he was raised from the dead because he said ahead of time that he was going to be raised on the third day. We got to, okay, since it's a big deal to you and not a big deal to me, I put him to death. What do you want? You, you, you afraid of it? So they put temple police. Do not let anybody near that tomb. Do not, for three days and three nights, do not let anybody get near that tomb. You understand that? Were they highly motivated with that idea? Because the last deception would be worse than the first. So he put the, Pilate says, look, I'll seal the tomb, but you're going to have to put guards on him. You, you want, I don't care if he comes out of the ground. I don't care what happens. My job was to kill him. Your job is, you, you want him to stay buried? Then keep him buried. I don't care. I don't care if he comes out of the grave or doesn't come out of the grave. It's no issue to me. You want, him, you want to secure the tomb? Then you put your men out there. And so they did. The temple police assigned to the sealed tomb of Jesus Christ gave testimony of his resurrection. They gave testimony of his resurrection. They said a severe earthquake came and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled away the stone and then sat on top of it. The shock and the whole fear of an empty tomb shocked their system as police to such a degree that they went unconscious, i.e., like were like dead men. <laughs> the angel sits on the stone of the tomb of Jesus Christ and all the temple police look like dead men laying around it. I got it. I read it out of the Bible. Matthew 28, 4. The guards shook out of fear 
of all, the angel, the earthquake, and everything that happened. Listen, with, do you imagine the? Do not let that tomb open. Don't let anybody near that tomb. Your heads are going to roll in, right? All of a sudden, there's an earthquake. Woo! And then there's a, the, the angel comes down, opens the door, and sits on it and says, Take a look. Yeah, da 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 da. And they fell over like dead men. That's a shock to the system, right? What a shock to the system. And God got a sense of humor. Since this happened to them and not to me, I call it a sense of humor. Then the report goes on. Matthew 28, 11 through 13 says, and some of the guards, you know who these what? These are ranked. They have to go back. The, you know, the PFC is going home. <laughs> the sergeant's got to go give a report. That's who shows up. The rank doesn't have privilege at this point, but it does have responsibility. And the guards, some of the guards, what, what happened to the others? They, they went like, you got it. I'm going <laughs> I've had the worst day of my life. There's not another dollar worth. I'm not going to back that tomb. I'm not going back to the post. I'm not going to tell them they can have my money. I don't care. Oh my goodness. I know I'm reading a lot into that, but some of the guards came and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, that's the Supreme Court of Israel. That's the Supreme Court of Israel is called into session. <laughs> they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and said, under oath, before the Supreme Court of Israel, under oath, you are not to say, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. You can read the whole thing in Matthew 28. <laughs> Listen, if you don't think evil is an enemy to your life, read that story. Look what evil would do. It wasn't enough to kill him. It wasn't enough to seal the tomb and put guards around it because somehow he, how did that happen? Well, an earthquake came, didn't you feel this? Shook the whole place. And I'm telling you, an angel came down and rolled the stone back and sat on it and said, take a look, boys. And we fell over like dead people. <laughs> well, look here, for your pain and suffering... <laughs> But it's going to cost you. you. You be quiet on this. Don't you people word of this. You let me handle the news. I'll handle the six o'clock news. You keep your mouth shut. You go home and keep your mouth shut. And you go back and you tell the guys who <laughs> said, I'm giving up my job and my career. I ain't never coming back to work. You tell them, you give them some hush money and you tell them, shut your mouth and don't say nothing. I'll handle all the six o'clock reports. My, my, my. This is a corrupt, this is as corrupt, this is an evil and corrupt generation. So in John, the 20th chapter, verse 9 and 10, it says, and yet, talking about his disciples, the disciples of Jesus Christ, and yet they did not understand the scriptures, how they had to be fulfilled, that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went away again, again, to their own homes. Look. Please, when you go home, don't be, don't be silent, disciples. Don't be silent, disciples. Don't be secret disciples of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to be a part of our study on Easter 23. We've covered a lot of technical stuff today. I suppose, Father... You've got to hear it a few times to really sink in and get it. But this is what Easter is all about. It's about the fulfilling of the plan of God. And, and we've been able to look at, at the fact that God is an orderly person and everything operates by order. 
And when it gets chaotic, it's because we've, we've lost sight of the word of God and the, the technical part of it sometimes. And so we've been brought back to it out of Leviticus and Matthew. These wonderful passages, Father, that just hook up and make everything orderly and consistent. We are so thankful for that and for a wonderful church that comes attentively to study. And I pray, Father, that we would impact St. Clair County for Christ. St. Clair County. And I, I thank you, Father, for these that have identified themselves with this and are willing to grow and, and be, be part of great ministry opportunities. We thank you, Father, for the great mission work you're already doing in our midst, that we may understand it and pray that greater things would come yet, even now. We pray for our offering today, Father. We spend a little on ourselves and most on reaching the world for Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.